In the introductory video, I've explained that SignalR solves the problem of real-time communication, it does so by establishing a duplex connection or at least an illusion of one. It uses three primary protocols for this. WebSockets is the first one, then it's server sent events, and then it's long polling. Today, we're gonna take a look at WebSockets. We're gonna try to understand what the heck is a WebSocket? Is it its own thing? Is it HTTP? And we're just gonna take a look at some examples of how WebSockets can be used in ASP.NET Core and just generally C Sharp. Remember, all the links are in the description. So if you want the source code or the link to the full playlist, go ahead and find it there. Let's take a look at the WebSockets project here. And here we will find only the configure method that's really been implemented. We also have the list of connections, which I'll get to in a second. We have static files. We initialize WebSockets. You don't really need to understand what this does. We will take a look at more under the hood implementation towards the end of the video. But in the ASP.NET Core style, this is just going to use a bunch of services under the hood to allow us to use WebSockets, which is what SignalR uses as well. Otherwise, what we're doing is we are just mapping an endpoint and to maintain that duplex connection that sort of you just establish a WebSocket connection and it just sits there. What we're going to do is imagine this code could be in a controller, but we have the context and from this context and the context is the HTTP context, right? If I hover over it, it's the HTTP context. It has a WebSockets property and what we're doing is on this endpoint, we're going to accept a WebSocket connection. And once we do, all I'm doing here is I'm just adding it to this list, which will be apparent why I'm doing it when I do a little demo. But the main overview of what is happening here is we're trying to receive some data just so we can enter this loop that just so we understand that the connection is successful. And then we just have an index to kind of say, all right, we're sending different messages. So the two things that we're doing is we're constructing a message and we're sending it to all connections. This is the first part. The second part is from the WebSocket, we receive a message, right? So we receive a message and we just print it to the console and we do it in a loop, right? Nothing too complicated, send messages to all clients and receive messages and log them. The way that we receive messages is that we're using this buffer. So we're reading things into the buffer and then we're just parsing it and printing it out to the console. In the end, we might close the connection and remove it from the list, right? So we're doing a little bit of cleanup at the end here. But otherwise, the code here is pretty straightforward. You don't really need to see me type this out manually. Then we have the index.html page, and this is just, we need to serve this using static files. The index.html page is super simple. We create a WebSocket connection on this URL here. We have, again, an index, just so we know that once the connection is open, we can create an interval function and every two seconds we are going to send some data. And I'm going to expect to see data space, some kind of index to be received on this end. So here we will be seeing received data, one, two, three, four, etc. On this end, on the browser, what we're gonna see is again, data received, but it will be in the console log in the browser. So here again, we're receiving data and we're sending data. And really, it's just to understand that the stuff that SignalR has built, you can build it yourself. Now, there might be a question around WebSockets. Some people do understand it. Some people don't understand it. But essentially, browsers have to implement these features. There will be a standard and they will call it WebSockets. And WebSockets is a way of communicating, kind of like the English language or any other language. As long as I say these things in, the, in this order with the following pronunciations, you understand what I'm saying. WebSockets are the same thing. HTTP is the same thing. I say these things in this order and you understand what I'm saying as long as you've done the correct implementation. Now, because this is a standard web browsers, they have to implement these on their own. So this is why when you look for web browser features, some browsers will support them and some browsers won't. So you have to check WebSockets itself as a technology, just a communication protocol. The class that you're seeing here is an interface that's described in the protocol. The implementation for it lives in the browser. And if you are wondering if the fetch API or any other classes like local storage have to go through the same process, yes, yes they do. Nevertheless, we have our WebSocket connection and I already went over what happens here. Let's start it up, let's see what happens, right? So I have the terminal, I'm just gonna do .NET run. Let's open up the website. So we only have the index.html page, which I'm gonna open in a second, but 
we're recording what we want to see is the uh, network tab let's land on the index page here we'll see the WebSocket connection being opened let's click on that and here we'll see messages so we're receiving message index zero if we come back to our app here we will see that the message index and some number is being generated here and then is being sent to all clients on the other end you will see here in the console we're printing the message that we're sending here on an interval so data and some number is being printed here and received is well basically this message hopefully it's nothing too complicated we're taking turns sending data and then receiving some data the important thing is that this connection is not being severed we're not having many http requests being sent back and forth so we're sending stuff and then we're waiting for a reply. We're sending stuff and then we're waiting for a reply. We're not doing that, right? We are just sending messages as they come along. The only thing that may be a little bit illusionary and be like, why are we not using regular HTTP? Is that I'm choosing to do this in order. I can do this out of order. I can receive 30 messages and then only send one. Okay, that can happen, no problem. If we look at the headers, the initial connection actually looks like an HTTP request. We have headers, we have response uh, headers, and uh, you know, uh, I mean, the only thing is like, the schema is a little bit different. Instead of HTTPS, we have WS, uh, status code is 101. And a couple of things, we'll find out why, but sec web, sec, uh, web, so WebSocket key and upgrade, uh, WebSocket kind of basically make it a WebSocket connection. But let's uh, meditate here for a little bit more. We're basically sending messages two ways. Uh, let's uh, take a look at what else we can do, right? So again, sequentially receiving and sending messages. What I want to do is let du let's duplicate this tab. And again, I'm going to open this here. And by the way, in the console, we're still printing these numbers. But what you will see now is we're actually receiving twice the amount of messages. So you'll see receive twice and send off one, receive twice and send off one. And that's because of this loop here where for every time we loop, I want to send the message to all the clients and each connection has its own state of this endpoint. Okay. And you can think of this as how SignalR essentially keeps track of all the clients and then sends off messages to all of them. And again, if I duplicate another connection, Again, this is going to be receiving all the previous messages from all the other clients that are currently going. And I, too bad I don't have the network tab here. But essentially, you will see here again this um, message index 6, 25, and 86. At the moment, you see which one is sending these messages because this is the oldest one. So it's sending the biggest number. This is the middle child, and this is the youngest child and those will be sending their uh, respective numbers. Those, these numbers are essentially correlating to how old these are. But hopefully you get the picture of communication and let's come back here and I'll just close it. What we've seen there is we have a web browser session, it establishes a connection and that connection just lives on. You can send messages both ways. You don't have to make a request and then receive data. You can receive some data and then send some data. What we've noticed there is if you've ever used SignalR or tried to use SignalR is we're not really calling any methods. That is SignalR functionality where you will have a hub and you will have a couple of messages and we will go over that later. The data received and hub method mapping happens separately and that's a SignalR thing. Here, what I want you to understand is you make a connection and then you're just able to send it both ways the client tracking or the connection tracking. Again, that's a signal R thing. And I had to partially implement this myself if I want to send data to, cur to currently all connected WebSockets. I have to keep track of these connections and then I have to send data to them manually, right? So just because the server has two WebSocket connections, that doesn't mean the data is automatically sent to all of them, right? So that's kind of like uh, maybe clearing a little bit of fog for signal R. Now let's go a little bit deeper because what happens here is we do dot use WebSockets and some magic happens. And I'm going to say we're going to go a little bit deeper, which is where we have the custom server. So let's close startup. We're not going to look at specifically what use WebSockets does, but let's open up this program. And I've used a bunch of documentation, again, from Mozilla, just of their specification, how they describe how to build backend endpoints. But what we're going to do here is we're going to do what the Kestrel server does. So the thing that hosts ASP.NET Core, 
it creates a socket connection. We bind to an IP address and then we're gonna start listening. What I'm not doing here is I'm not keeping track of all the connections and I'm not allowing multiple connections. I'm only gonna have one connection and really that's just an implementation detail. I don't wanna spend too much time on this example, but for the socket on which we're listening, we're going to accept a connection. That is going to be its own individual socket. Okay, so this is the socket that we're now referring to. Network stream is just for us to be able to read from that socket. We then have a buffer and the buffer again. When you're working with streams, that's just how you do it. And uh, I'm sorry, this is not a tutorial on buffers. But essentially what we do is we load data into a buffer, which is a byte array. So we're just reading some bytes. The browser is gonna send some bytes and we're just gonna read some bytes, right? Just zeros and ones. We will then parse the bytes into a string and if string contains a get, that means the WebSocket connection is trying to get established. It's making a get request, just regular get HTTP request. Now what we're doing is we're looking for SEC WebSocket key. So that little header that was appended there, you basically, the way that they describe it, I hopefully understood it correctly, but you basically make an accept WebSocket header. And what you do is I'm, I'm essentially uh, constructing uh, manually an HTTP response, which I then get the bytes off and then I just write it back to the stream and I flush it. So I return a response, but now I have a while loop and uh, I don't end here. So the connection is never closed. And what I do is I just go ahead and read more bytes. And this is where a little bit, or maybe not even a little bit, the most confusing part happens. The message that the WebSocket connection is receiving on the server side, so browser is sending the message, that message is encoded, so you have to do a little bit of decoding. Uh, again, a, another link here on the format of how the message is encoded and decoded. But essentially, and this is actually, uh, this is, will be worth looking at this in just a second so we can uh, have, so yeah, so this is basically what the packet looks like and we will see it a little bit more closely. So let's go ahead and first run this. So we're gonna open up the server. Let's do .NET run here. And you're not gonna get any messages because, well, it's not an ASP in a core application. However, what we're gonna do is we're gonna open index.html in this file browser. We're gonna drag it over to the browser and we're just gonna open it here. So what happens here now is, I mean, you can't really see it, but let's come back here and we're still sending data and we're receiving it and we can see that the connection is open. Before this, what we'll see is what is being printed here is if I slowly scroll up to here is this first request that we're seeing here. So just a regular get HTTP request and all we're doing is we're just not closing it at the end and we're able to receive data and we will be able to send data back to it as well. However, I just chose not to do it in this example. As for the data parsing and decoding, this is just a little process that you have to go through. But let's take a look at this bit here. The first byte is an operation code and described here, it basically just either has no meaning on basically says it's a text data or binary data, etc. Uh, but I skip that very first byte and I basically say, I mean, it doesn't matter. I, I'm just gonna ignore it. The second thing that I'm doing is I'm reading in the length of the message. So if you watched my Redis video about how we communicate with Redis, I mean, the same kind of thing happens here. We gotta do a little bit of a, a little bit of a malarkey here. So this is the first eight bits. This is the first byte. The second byte here, what we have is the f the first bit of the byte. We have a mask and then the payload length. So the mask, this first bit here is what we're doing here is we're basically just taking this byte and we're subtracting it from the same value as if it would this would have been one and the rest is zero. What this basically tells us is the payload length up to 126. So from zero to 125, if it's over that, we need to use a different protocol. So I have comments here, but essentially I'm only supporting messages that are under the 126 byte length. So what happens here is if the first bit would be zero, we would get a bit flip and then it basically means that the first byte is not the thing that represents the length, it will be the next couple of bytes. But yeah, after it, it gets a little bit easier, maybe not so easier, but in the next four bytes, you get a key or a mask that it can be referred to 
and you just do XOR decoding. I'm just saying XOR decoding, but I don't know if it's even worth explaining this algorithm. And I don't know if I'm actually doing a good job because you, you, I'd say the only way that you can really understand it is if you're gonna go step-by-step -step debug it. But essentially we get a length, we get a key, we create a new array where this is the data that we're going to parse. Where then we'll, we're then having a length where what we're doing is we're offsetting by six because we want to skip the first bit, the first byte, the second byte, and the four bytes which contain the key. And uh, th we just want to leave those alone because the rest of the thing is the payload. So we sort of slowly iterate through that. We XOR it by the bit in the key and we slowly iterate through those one by one. And then in the end, we fill up the data. That will be the data and then we print it. So, I mean, rambling on this is all the this is how we basically decode and receive the data this is what signal r and use web sockets will ultimately use underneath the covers now here you will see this example and a lot of this stuff looks already pretty complicated i don't really write code like this at work either uh, i mean this stuff is already built for me uh, you will see that to make many connection work a lot more work will need to go into this as well if you are not satisfied with this answer and you want to go deeper you're gonna have to do that on your own because you're gonna go into the land of native c or c plus plus implementations of how does windows expose this or how does the runtime implement this because and by the runtime i mean the dotnet runtime dotnet runtime has to have an implementation that talks to the operating system about how to use this hardware to open up these sockets or to start listening to these sockets. But hopefully you can kind of bury the hatchet there. It's making a connection that allows you to talk both ways. It is still pretty much an HTTP connection, although it's just one that isn't closed. And the reason we can distinct it between regular HTTP request and the WebSocket one is because of a couple of headers and uh, the response that we make and it all has to comply with the WebSocket specification here. I think that is pretty much all I have on the WebSockets. If you are still confused or have any questions about them, do leave them in the comment section or ask them on my Discord server. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.